Hello, everyone. <clears throat> We're going to start in about 30 seconds. Thank you. All right, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today in Origin and Causes webinar titled Fire, and Expl Fire Investigation 101. My name is George Gustandi, and I will be the moderator today. <clears throat> I'm really excited about this webinar because, you know, we, we ask you guys for feedback in the questionnaires, usually after webinars, and we always ask you, or typically we ask, you know, what other topics uh, do you want to learn about? And people always ask, can you teach us how you think and how you process a fire, a typical fire scene? So this is seems like a lot of people have these questions in their mind. And so we're very excited to be able to give you the 101 on fire investigation um, today. So thank you all for joining us. I hope all of you and your families are in good health and in safety, uh, enjoying the last few days of some sunshine, uh, depending where you are in the country, but I'm glad you've made it out to us and that you've joined us. I just wanna go through a couple of quick points with you first. We're gonna be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions via the text box that's right here in uh, the GoToWebinar platform. We're gonna to try to get to as many questions as possible. Any questions that we don't get to, we will uh, send you an email after the webinar uh, and make sure that we get to answer your questions. Also, we're recording the webinar. It's gonna be posted on our website, on LinkedIn and YouTube pages. Uh, you'll receive a link to those uh, in a few days with a completion certificate uh, via email. At the end of the webinar, you're going to, when you're closing the GoToWebinar window, the program is going to prompt, send like a prompt uh, onto your screen asking you a few questions about the webinar. We'd love to hear your feedback, um, you know, talking, giving feedback about the presenter, about the content, and uh, also asking you if you would like us to sign you up to next month's national tour. You know, typically we go across the country in October. Uh, in every province and uh, large cities, and we can we do what is called our national tour. Unfortunately, due, due to COVID, uh, we can't go out and see you guys uh, in in each province. But what we've done is we've spun it, and we're going to be doing a virtual version of it this year. And we're very excited about it. it the topic is on fraud. Uh, and so at the very end of this topic, uh, this presentation, when you get prompted, it, it will ask you if you want us to sign you up to the national tour. It's free as it always is. And uh, you get the opportunity to take a look at the different topics we're going to be covering within fraud. Uh, you know, it'll be like structure fire fraud, like arsons, for example, vehicle arsons. Um, uh, like structural claims where, where people may submit fraudulent uh, claims from the structural discipline, uh, break and enters, as well as water frauds, which is really cool, really interesting topic because we're seeing a, a ton of those these days. Uh, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please feel free to email our team at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. Okay, let's get started. I wanna to introduce to you our speaker. Today we have Angela Peterson joining us. She's a fire and explosion investigator based in our Victoria, British Columbia office. She's a certified fire investigation instructor through NAFI, the National Association of Fire Investigators. She has over 15 years of experience and has conducted over 200 fire and explosion investigations uh, in her career and is an ex has been accepted as an expert witness uh, in provincial court and the court of Queen's Bench. So I'm going to 
pass off the mic to Angela. Thank you very much, Angela, for joining us as well today. Thank you, George, and welcome everyone. Today, I wanna to talk about the methodology a fire investigator uses while conducting an origin and cause investigation. So how does a fire investigator examine a scene such as this and be able to draw a conclusion as to the origin and cause of the fire? This, this situation it was a basement fire in a house. The tenants were living in the home with no heat or power and they were utilizing propane heaters for warmth. Combustibles were placed too close to the heating attachment on the propane tank and there was a fire. This was a bedroom fire in a three-story apartment building. Again, the room was fully involved in fire. After I excavated and reconstructed the contents of the room, I found evidence of a careless smoking fire. So what is the process of going from a charred mess such as this to an origin and cause determination? What happens in between receiving the assignment and issuing that final fire investigation report? During this presentation, I'm going to explain the basic steps of a fire investigation and answer some of those questions. So all the information I'm going to discuss today is found in the NFPA 921 Guide for Fire and Explosion Investigations. This publication sets the bar for scientific-based investigation and analysis of fire and explosion incidents. The extent to which this guide is being recognized by the Canadian courts as authoritative is ever increasing. To have a chance at being successful in court, your expert must show that a non-biased, systematic approach was adhered to. The last time I was in court, the defense counsel actually had a copy of this 921 on the table in front of him. They are aware of the requirement to follow the procedures and guidelines set out in this, and when there are deviations, they must be justified. So uh, actually on a side note, the NFPA 921 is on a four year revision cycle and they have just released the 2021 edition. One interesting change to the new edition is that that entire chapter on classification of fire cause has been deleted. So although classification of fires is different than origin and cause determination, there's already some debate surrounding the changes when it comes to the fire investigator's ability to offer an opinion on classification in the courtroom, i.e. accidental, incendiary, natural, and undetermined. So if there is an interest out there on this and all the other changes in the new edition, let us know and perhaps we can do a webinar on this topic. So the systematic approach, which is used in all of the physical sciences, including fire investigation, is based on the scientific method. And it's only by applying the scientific method consistently to every investigation that the investigator can substantiate and defend their origin and cause determination. So let's look at this scientific method. These are the steps for both fires and explosions. You gotta recognize the need, define the problem, collect data, analyze that data, develop a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, and select a final hypothesis. So first recognize the need and identify that there's a problem. Well, there's been a fire or an explosion and we need to know what happened. Define the problem. We need to know where and how the fire or explosion originated. An origin and cause investigation is required. Collecting the data. At this point, all the facts about the incident are gathered and documented. To analyze the data, we must understand and attribute meaning to the data that we've collected. Develop hypotheses. So based on the data that's been collected, we then develop explanations for the event. Testing the hypotheses, compare each hypothesis to all the known facts. The testing is designed to refute the hypotheses rather than to prove it. 
And this process is designed to prevent relying on evidence that only supports the hypothesis. And select the final hypothesis. A review of the entire process ensuring that all credible data is accounted for and all alternative hypotheses have been considered and eliminated. So the various activities required to determine the origin and cause using this scientific method occur continuously and sometimes simultaneously. So the first step of the scientific method is generally our first contact with the adjuster. There's been a fire or an explosion, and an origin and cause investigation is requested. You need to know what product, action, emission, or malfunction caused the fire. For myself, pre-planning at this stage can increase the efficiency and therefore the chances of, accept, of success for the overall investigation. So I'm just considering, are there any safety concerns? Do I need heavy equipment? other specialized tools? Do we need any other experts, engineers? Are there security considerations for the site? Do, we, do you need to get fencing or 24 hour security to maintain the scene continuity? Have all interested parties been given reasonable notice of the scene exam and have they been given the opportunity to participate in the investigation? Failure to provide a potential interested party with notice of the scene investigation could later result in that interested party claiming evidence foliation. But that is not to say that the site must be jointly examined. So collecting the data, gathering and documenting all the facts about the incident. So some of the activities at this stage include witness and occupant interviews, examination of the scene, evidence recognition and collection, photography, site diagrams, research, etc. So I want to look at a case study to see what an investigation looks like in practice. I chose a non-complex fire investigation. However, the methodology is the same regardless of the size or complexity of the incident for both fires and explosions. This is how any fire investigator, whether in the public or private sector, investigates a loss and arrives at the expert opinion you read in that final report. So this case study was from an assignment for an origin and cause investigation involving a residential structure. This is the home prior to the fire as shown on Google Street View. The structure was a one-story single-family residence with a single attached garage. So examining the scene, the fundamental purpose of conducting a scene exam is to collect all the available data and to document the scene. Once this structure is torn down or repaired, any overlooked data is lost forever. This particular site exam took approximately five hours. The size of the structure, the degree of damage, amount of excavation or debris removal, and the complexity of scene reconstruction vary at each lost site. So, of course, on scene time varies from file to file. As we move through this case study, I will highlight some but not every observation I made during my scene exam. As the goal is to highlight the overall methodology of a fire investigation, not every piece of data that was collected will be pointed out. It would be impossible to make it through the case study in the time allotted. So I conducted an initial site assessment to determine the scope of the investigation. Again, I'm considering if any equipment or extra manpower is needed, determining the safety of the structure, and I'm determining what areas warrant further study. I did an initial walkthrough to take an overall look at the entire site and structure, both inside and out. This particular structure is small, but you could imagine on larger complex losses that an initial walkthrough to determine the scope of the investigation is integral prior to moving forward. The point is to assess all areas that are pertinent to not only the origin of the fire, but also the spread of the fire. By not looking at every by not looking at every area, valuable data can be missed. 
I was investigating a house fire, initially thinking it was an accidental kitchen fire. And when I looked inside a closet in the basement, I saw there was a fire there as well. And the owners had been trying to burn their house down. So again, important to look at everything. So during this initial scene assessment, I'm already collecting data for the determination of the origin. This particular structure I examined starting from the least amount of damage, least amount of fire damage to the area with the most amount of fire damage. In this case, I started with a thorough examination of the exterior of the building. I started at the front of the garage and worked my way around the house in a clockwise direction. The front of the garage and this gable end sustained only minor fire damage. Heading to the side of the house, we can see that this gable end is burned through and the roof is gone. The fire was in the attic in this portion of the house. There was a security camera, but it was just a decoy and it was not hooked up to anything. It didn't give us any further information. There's no fire damage on the stucco above this side door or the window. That tells me that the fire was in the attic in this area, but it was not venting out of these openings on the main floor on this side of the house. The gas utility entered on this side of the house. It was active at the time of the incident and was discontinued during the fire. This tells me there's at least one gas appliance inside the house that needs to be considered. Moving to the back side of the house, I observed that the roof was mostly consumed. There was more roof remaining on this side versus on the right side here. The charring above these two windows on the right hand side showed me that the fire was venting from the inside out of these windows. The room on this corner of the house is an area of interest for further examination. I could also see that when the flame vented out of these windows, it extended into the overhang of the house and was able to make its way up into the attic. First on scene firefighters reported fire venting out of these windows when they first arrived on scene. This gable end of the house was intact as compared to the opposite end, which was mostly consumed by the fire. Note there's no blackening above this window. The hydrometer is on this side of the house and service was active at the time of the incident. The location of the meter and the conduit running down from it tells me the electrical panels in the basement on this wall. So if this house had been more severely damaged, I would know where to look for the panel in the debris. As we come around the front of the house, I noted a considerable amount of cigarette butts on the ground near the front door. So we know there's most likely a smoker residing in the home. The fire damage to the top of the doorway and the overhang above indicate this door was open at some point during the fire. The front side of this door is relatively clean. The back side is soot stained down to the doorknob, which matches the level of soot staining inside that front room. So this, this indicates the door was closed for most of the fire and opened in the latter stages. There was signs of forcible entry to this door and its frame. And this was determined to be a result of a passerby kicking in the door prior to fire crews arriving to try and look for occupants. So the house was secure at the time of the fire. After examining the exterior of the home, I found the fire damage to be consistent with a fire that originated that had originated on the inside of the structure and extended out. So I started the interior scene exam at that front door, which opened into the living room. The contents of this room were mostly unburned. There was blackening to the drywall on both the ceiling and the walls. And the fire damage increased in severity towards the left hand side of this picture. You can see charring to this wood door frame right here. Smoking materials were observed on the coffee table in this living room. So I must consider that perhaps the occupant did smoke inside the home as well. Behind this wall here, 
and this door, excuse me, this doorway access, accesses this hallway that runs behind this wall. But I'm standing in that doorway, I'm looking down the hallway. You can see it's more heat damaged as compared to the living room. The damage was greater at the top portion of the hallway and lessened towards the floor. This fire pattern is a result of the hot gas and smoke layer traveling along the ceiling and banking down. As well, note the charring to the wood in this inward swinging door and the drywall behind it. The door was open at the time of the fire and the pattern on the door and the walls show the effects of the fire moving into the hallway from behind where I'm standing. Damage to the rooms off of this hallway, there was two bedrooms and a bathroom. It was mostly smoke damage and not much heat damage. So the, I know the direction of fire travel was from where I'm standing towards the end of this hallway. So the fire had come from behind where I'm standing. So the hallway from the previous slide is to the right now, here. This boarded over window on the far wall is the back wall of the kitchen and it's one of those windows we, we observed from the exterior during our walk around the back of the house. This is one of those windows that had blackening above it and the other window is to the left. The roof is burned away in this area. Both this pantry door and the doorway opposite show, la la excuse me, show loss of mass at the top with charring lessening towards down towards the doorknobs. This pattern is a result of the fire traveling out of the kitchen. So before moving into the kitchen, which at this point I'm thinking is probably my room of origin, I examined the basement and garage. The basement had a few feet of water in it from fire suppression activities that was subsequently pumped out in order to get down there. The basement did not sustain any heat damage. Neither the electrical panel nor the distribution wiring in the basement was damaged. The gas furnace and hot water tank were undamaged by fire, and those were the only two gas appliances located within the house. The attached garage was examined, and the contents were not heat damaged. I determined the roof above the garage had burned away from the fire traveling through the attic from above the kitchen. So the fire patterns that I've observed so far, both inside and outside the house, indicated to me that the room of origin for the fire was the kitchen. And more specifically, this side of the kitchen. This here is the other window that we saw at the back of the house with the charring above it. The roof in this area was mostly consumed by fire. And this is the burned through gable end of the house that we saw from the exterior. So this side of the room was covered in drywall, insulation, charred roof trusses, shingles. So this area had to be excavated. I removed the debris layer by layer in order to uncover the contents of the room that you see here. So now I had to examine the room contents in this area in order to narrow down the area of origin. So both the upper and lower cabinets along these two walls were mostly consumed by fire. You can see the sink laying here. It had been in the cab lower cabinet on this wall. So moving towards the left side of that far wall, I noted the metal on the side of the fridge facing the stove displayed greater discoloration and deformity from exposure to heat as compared to all the other sides. There had been a base cabinet located between the fridge and the stove. So portions of the bottom and the sides of this wood cabinet remained. So the consumption of the cabinet was from the top down. I noted there was greater fire damage on the left side of the stove versus the right. And at this point, I have a more defined area of origin. Now, instead of this entire side of the kitchen as an area of origin, I'm looking at the area between the fridge and the right hand side of the stove. Next, I reconstructed the items on the stovetop. 
These two pots match the patterns left on the surface of the stovetop, as well as the patterns on the control panel and the side of the electric grill. The food inside the small pot on this rear burner was not burnt. The plastic handle of the small pot facing the large pot was consumed. Both the inside and outside of this large pot was discolored from being exposed to high heat and had an oily residue on the inside. The rear control panel was damaged from heat exposure from the lower left to the upper right. The wood base cabinet that had been located between the fridge and the stove was consumed from the top down. And the electric grill was more fire damaged on the left side facing the large pot versus the right rear or bottom sides. Leading me to a point of fire origin inside the large pot. So at this point, I have a working hypothesis. A pot of oil was left unattended on the front left element of the stove. The oil inside the pot reached its ignition temperature and produced an open flame which spread to the cabinets above. So if I were to stop at this point and declare this an accidental cooking fire, the investigation would be incomplete. Another expert could easily refute my determination. And that's because all the data has not been collected and analyzed. What are the ignition sources available in this area? Which one of them started the fire? More data needs to be collected. So next, I identified and evaluated all reasonable potential ignition sources proximate to the area of origin. So let's look at the potential heat sources. We see the refrigerator. There's a duplex receptacle behind the fridge. This branch circuit wiring running through the attic space. There was an electrical outlet to the right of the stove. We have the electric grill on, uh, on the stovetop, the microwave. There was a toaster, the range, and another electrical outlet behind that base cabinet to the left of the stove. So I have identified, gathered, and documented the data. But now, now the data must be analyzed so I can actually understand the meaning of the data. This is what enables me to form and test hypotheses based on the evidence. I must hypothesize each potential heat source as part of the ignition sequence for the fire. So the ignition sequence is the factors that allowed the ignition source, the fuel, and the oxidant to react causing the fire. And the oxidant for most fires is usually just the available air in the atmosphere. So how do we accomplish this? Through the analysis of all the potential ignition sources and the available fuel sources in and near that area of origin. So we're asking, asking ourselves, I'm asking myself these questions. Is the ignition source competent to ignite the fuel, i.e., does the source have sufficient energy and is it capable of transferring that energy to a nearby fuel long enough to raise that fuel to its ignition temperature? Is the ignition source close enough to the fuel to be capable of igniting it? Is there evidence of ignition? And is there a pathway for a fire ignited in the first fuel to ignite the main fuel? So let's consider the fridge. Is it a competent ignition source? Well, there's, there's a compressor motor, electrical components, a fan motor. So yes, there are components that could fail and produce heat. Were these potential heat sources close to a fuel? Well, you have the insulation and plastic surrounding the mechanical and electrical components of the fridge, and they could act as a first fuel for the heat source. However, 
the electrical and mechanical components of the fridge were intact and showed no evidence of ignition. So these questions were considered and for each potential ignition source, and each source was hypothesized as part of the ignition sequence for this fire. So I looked at the duplex receptacle behind the fridge. This is where the fridge was plugged in. Although it was exposed to some heat from the fire, the insulation remained on the conductors inside the box, and there was no signs of an electrical event or failure. This was not the heat source for this fire. The branch circuit wiring running through that attic space. So this wire had fallen from the attic when the ceiling failed from the fire in the kitchen. The copper conductors were intact and the insulation on them was consumed from exposure to the heat of the fire after they fell into the room. There was no evidence of electrical arcing and it was not a competent ignition source for this fire. Next, I looked at the receptacle to the right of the stove, the outlet itself, as well as the connection between the two plugs and the outlet were considered as possible heat sources. So the plastic remained on the conductors inside the box. They didn't sustain any heat damage. The connection between the conductors and the terminal screws were tight with no evidence of a failure. Two male cord ends had, had melted into the face of the outlet from exposure to heat of the fire. The stranded copper conductors attached to these two male ends broke away from the cords that led to the microwave and the toaster when those appliances fell to the floor during the fire. And you can see the plastic face of the outlet is fairly intact. This source did not provide the heat for the ignition sequence of this fire. The electric grill on the stovetop was not a competent ignition source as it was not plugged in at the time of the fire. You can see the cord right here. The bottom of the grill was undamaged, which tells me the element underneath it was not turned on. So this grill was neither the ignition source nor the first fuel ignited. The microwave, it was found on the ground to the right of the stove. It was thermally damaged from exposure to the fire. The plastic turntable the, it, that supports the glass plate inside the microwave was not melted and there was no food inside. If the motor had failed and created heat, I would, I would expect to see the plastic inside melted. The wires inside the control panel still had plastic on them. If they had provided the heat, if the controls had provided the heat source for this fire, I, would, I should find more thermal damage inside this control panel. There's no evidence that this appliance provided the heat for the ignition of this fire. The toaster was examined. The plastic components inside were intact. There was greater fire damage on the exterior as compared to inside the toaster. The stranded copper conductors of the cord had mechanically separated when the toaster fell off the counter during the fire. And the toaster was located to the right of the stove and not within our area of origin. Next, I considered the electrical outlet between the fridge and the stove behind that base cabinet. The plastic face was intact as it was protected by the cabinet at the time of the fire. Also, there was nothing plugged into this outlet at the time of the fire. It was not a competent heat source to ignite the wood cabinet and there was no evidence of any failure. The range cord and the outlet it was plugged into. As you can see, both were undamaged by fire and it did not provide the heat source for this fire. I had to consider smoking materials as a potential ignition source. I had evidence that the occupant did smoke in the house. Could a carelessly discarded cigarette in the kitchen be a competent ignition source for this fire? Well, one discarded cigarette does not have sufficient heat energy to transfer to the available fuels 
locate in in a kitchen long enough to raise those fuels to their ignition temperature. What about if a whole ashtray was dumped into a garbage can in the kitchen? It would be possible that a cigarette could be a competent ignition source in that situation. However, I located the garbage can and not only was it not in the area of origin, but the plastic bag and some of its contents were still intact inside. So after all these potential heat sources were hypothesized as part of the ignition sequence for the cause of this fire and disproved, I considered the range as the heat source. The inside of the oven was undamaged by fire. So the fire did not originate inside the oven and extend outward into the room. The left side of the control panel at the back of the stove was damaged from the bottom left to the upper right, like I had mentioned before. This pattern was a result of this lower cabinet to the left burning, and this side of the controls being exposed to that heat of the burning cabinet. The controls themselves on the left displayed greater damage at the face of the panel versus inside the panel. The stove element control switches had push and turn stems, so the likelihood of the knob being turned on accidentally is minimal. The electrical components at the back of the control switches did not show any evidence of ignition. The position of the control knobs for the left two burners could not be confirmed due to the degree of fire damage to the knobs and the metal stems. The front left burner area had a protection pattern which indicated the large pot was there at the time of the fire. And the pot was heavily heat damaged both inside and out and had an oily residue on the inside. So back to our hypothesis. Hypothesis, a pot of oil was placed on the front left burner and turned on and left unattended. The oil increased in temperature to the point of ignition and produced an open flame. This flame produced sufficient heat for a long enough duration to ignite, ignite the upper cabinets and their contents, and the fire was able to extend from this secondary fuel package to the rest of the room and beyond. So we must compare the hypothesis to all the known facts, as well as the scientific knowledge relevant to this incident. So the point of origin was inside the large pot located on the left front burner of the stove. The pot sustained high heat on the inside as evidenced by the discoloration and deformity as well as the burned oily residue on its bottom. The interior of the small pot on the rear left burner was clean and the food inside was unburned. If both pots had been exposed to a fire originating elsewhere, the insides should have sustained more similar fire damage. There's no evidence to support an ignition sequence that involves burning material from above, dropping down into the pot or onto the stove. Re research shows that smooth top stove elements can provide the heat required for cooking oil to reach its ignition temperature. And the duration and temperature of the heat produced by flaming oil is sufficient to ignite the cabinets and their contents directly above the stove. So the hot element was a competent ignition source. The first fuel to ignite was the oil. The oil was hot enough and had a pathway to the next available fuel, which was the cabinet and its contents above the stove. The evidence supports the hypothesis that this fire was a result of an unattended, unattended pot of oil left on a hot element on the stovetop. So this was a, a, a non-complex fire, but no matter what type of fire and explosion I'm dealing with or how large the loss, this is the methodology used, the scientific method. So just to review, we recognize the need, we define the problem, collect the data, analyze the data, develop hypotheses, test those hypotheses, and select a final hypothesis. So this case study was a straightforward fire. There was no liability exposure or subrogation potential. 
But in cases where there is, a properly conducted investigation using the method methodology discussed will stand up to any challenges as this as your file moves forward. So thank you very much for your time and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Angela. Um, we're going to be taking your questions now. Several people have submitted questions. Um, and so uh, we'll get to it right away. I just need to flip the screen if you guys don't mind bearing with me. Uh, give me a quick second, sorry guys. All right, and then we do this. Okay, so first question that, that I've seen here is, first question I see is, in the last photo, where did the big pot go as it was not in the photo, the original photo? So let me just go back, um, Angela, there are some images where the pot is not in the image, like this one. Do you see my Do you see my screen? I don't, but I know what you're talking about. Okay. Initially, um, that pot was on. I, that pot was found on the floor. Actually, both pots were found on the floor. Okay. And when I reconstructed the scene, I located the pots. They had been knocked off the stovetop at some point during the fire, whether that was when the ceiling or the roof was failing. And then I placed them in their pre-fire positions. And I think the, the picture that's being referred to, I had used an earlier picture when the stove, or excuse me, when the pot was not on the stove, because I was trying to sh see, uh, show the control panel and everything more clearly. Okay. Yeah. So, so in that instance, like, I guess you took a look at the pot, you found the pot, you looked in it and you saw some like residual oil, I guess. Yeah. The oily residue that I had referred to was, uh, yeah, the remnants of the oil that had burned inside the pot. And I don't know if the pictures reflect it very well, but the damage inside on the walls on the inside of the pot and the outside of the pot, uh, there was quite a bit of uh, thermal damage and the pot was actually deformed from heat as well. Okay. And like I, I had said in the presentation, the small pot uh, right beside it, there was unburned food in it and the food was in perfect condition. And I, I even, I had accounted for the fact that the small pot did have a lid on it and I don't think the large pot did, but I would expect to see more similar fire damage if the, that area had been exposed to the fire as opposed to the, lar the fire originating within the large pot. Great, next question. Some of the determinations were based at least in part on where items like the toaster or the microwave were found. How can we be certain that this is where the items landed as a result of the fire, as opposed to being shoved into that location during the suppression activities? That's a great question. That is a good question. Well, um, uh, so the duplex receptacle to the right of the stove, the two male and plug ends that were there, I determined those to be for the toaster and for the microwave. Now, I mean, I, uh, average length of a cord on a on a on a toaster or a microwave, you know, you maybe have a two feet 
two feet ish. So to put those items, and that helped me determine that those items were to the right of the stove based on the location of the duplex receptacle, the fact that there was countertop availability there. Um, and as well, I do talk to the fire department uh, when I go into a scene and the, I, I try to work with the fire department to determine where items were and what was moved during those suppression and overhaul activities. Great. Got another really cool question. <laughs> How do you know the difference between an arson versus an accidental unattended cooking <laughs> incident? That is a really good question. And this goes back to the changes in the NFPA 921 that I was talking about earlier. The fact that they've removed the classification uh, of fire. So yes, the pot was left on the element, the element was left on and the oil ignited. Now to speak to intent of the occupant of that house, you know, did they, do that on purpose to try and burn their house down? That is a really good question. In this particular case, the occupant did not make it out of the house, and this was a fatal fire. So um, this leads me to more of an accidental cause for this fire. Yeah, and typically, correct me if I'm wrong, um, typically intent is something that um, is not within the scope of a forensic investigation. Uh, typically, your your objective is to um, analyze physical evidence and to essentially report on causation based on that physical evidence. Is that would you say that that's accurate, Angela? That is a good way to put it, George. Yes, I. So we, I have the origin and I have the cause of the fire, and and yeah, as soon as you start bringing intent into it, I have, I have no supporting evidence as to intent, but we definitely have the, the, the evidence to support the origin and cause. Yeah, sometimes the, sometimes like in this case, if the person passed, um, as, as you've kind of deduced, it's like, okay, well, it seems like an accidental situation that just went, went wrong, but typically um, you would get kind of more information in statements and sometimes people touch upon intent when they're giving statements. Would you say that that's true as well? I would say that's true. You can garner a lot of information from occupant and witness interviews for sure. Okay. Another question. One, I'm wondering whether we can get a copy of, of the NFPA 921 by email. As of right now, the 2021 edition is only available as a hard copy, but if you keep an eye on the nfpa.org website, generally they make it available in PDF form. And I'm not sure if there's a cost to that, but uh, right now it's only in hard copy. They're 110 bucks. Okay. Yeah, the PDF is not available as of yet. Like they just, I think it came out in April. Um, and it's just the hard copy so far. And I just got mine in the mail this week, actually. So, <laughs> okay, cool. Next question. On the news, when they report building fires, at the end of the article, they usually say that the cause of the fire is still under investigation, but there's never a follow up to tell us what the cause was. Is there a resource to go to find out what the cause of a fire was for building fires? on the news. Yeah, I find that too. There's generally no follow-up uh, to, to give us resolution to what, what caused these fires. Um, and a lot of the time, the fire departments uh, don't, uh, don't freely tell you what their conclusions are when they do origin and cause fire investigations. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's another resource to find those answers. I know, like, um, sometimes you have to do a freedom, of, if you were that interested or if you had a connection to that fire, you could do a freedom of information uh, request. But yeah, a lot of times you never find out what happened to those structures. Yeah. Okay. Next question. How do you reconcile your cause classification when one of the alternative hypotheses have potential but are not likely? 
what is a defendable threshold between probable and possible? Ooh, that's a good so question. Like, yeah, really, 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 uh, really, really thoughtful. Well, like, in, so you, if I, you've got like one that it seems like you have two hypotheses, one that's like, po like definitely possible and another being probable. What's the threshold where you eliminate one of the two thresholds, or sorry, one of the two hypotheses, if I understood it correctly? Yeah, well, the NSPA 921 does discuss uh, probable versus possible, and they use that 51% uh, uh, as the threshold. It's, it's uh, that 51% makes it probable. Um, using the evidence, to uh, refute hypotheses, but that same evidence you have to use to defend your hypotheses as most probable. So if two hypotheses are both possible, then that brings us to an undetermined fire. But as soon as a hypothesis has the evidence to support it, and it is the most probable at 51% or more, that is our origin and cause determination. And it is supportable with the physical evidence. Cool. Okay, next question. Angela, you mentioned that you interviewed firefighters and a passerby who kicked in the front door. What interview method did you employ? Was it recorded in a digital fashion? And how does the result of that, of what you were told, aid in your deductive reasoning? Mm -hmm. Another good question. Um, I did not record uh, my interviews at this fire. I, I interviewed, I, did, I don't take statements. I interviewed and then I made notes on um, what they had to say. In this particular case, and in every case, if I see signs of forcible entry on a window or a door, like it looks like the, the door has been kicked in and the frame is all damaged, um, this speaks to uh, potential arson. Did somebody enter the structure and, and cause the fire or light the fire? In this particular case, we know that the structure was secure at the time of the fire and that passerby was trying to check for occupants and kicked in the door. So, Okay, great. Next question. How could you determine the fire started from the top to below in the cabinet between the fridge and the stove? The, that particular wood cabinet, I pointed out in the picture there that the wood remained at the bottom, like the base, when I cleared the debris, I could see the wood base of the cabinet and some of the sides uh, remained and the rest had been consumed, which leads me to the, the fire for that cabinet burning from the top down. And as that cabinet burned, the heat from that between the fridge and the stove gave us that, that kind of V pattern on the back of the control panel of the stove. Cool. All right, next question. Have your investigative reports ever been used to supplement the investigations by public authorities, i.e. fire departments or the police? Have my fire reports been used by the public sector as part of their fire investigation? I believe is that, that the question? is being asked, yes. Uh, not that I am aware of. I don't, I can't recall an instance off the top of my head where my report has been requested and reviewed by a public service. Yeah. Yeah. I'm now sure. we, uh, looking at it from the other way, we have um, reviewed photos and reports from police and fire departments. Yes. And I have had my reports reviewed by other experts, both my photos and my reports. They didn't get, they had been brought in uh, late and they didn't have access to the scene to examine. So they reviewed my uh, report and photographs and they were, they rendered an opinion 
uh, uh, based on that. And in the same token, we could do that if if you if we get involved late and the scene is not available to us, we can review the photos and a report of another expert and see did they use the scientific method, you know, go over that report and see if we can, uh, you know, what what findings we uh, we come to. Great. When Angela writes her final fire report on this incident, how much detail and information does she write in regards to the data used to eliminate the alternative hypothesis? Uh, does she include it all or does she just document, uh, sorry, it's cutting out on my screen mm -hmm. here, or does she just document that it was considered and eliminated? I imagine well, it has something to do with the directive from your client. If they're looking for a short report or... Exactly. Well, in this particular case, as I had mentioned, there was no liability exposure. This was owner-occupied. Um, there was no potential for subrogation. That stove had not failed. Now, yeah, to, for, with direction from the client or from the adjuster, depending on what kind of report they want, and if you know if, if cost is a factor, uh, I can do a, just a short a, a shorter report with my findings. Or if this is potentially going to go somewhere, a, a full technical report outlining every potential origin and 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 uh, ruling things out and a final determination that could all go into the report. It just all depends. But regardless of what kind of report. I have all of the documentation, all the photographs, and all my notes from everything I collected and analyzed uh, from that scene. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, just to add to that, a lot of times adjusters are are giving that direct directive. Um, they know that they, you know, have a certain budget or they have the reserves set. And they're saying, listen, if there's nothing to sink our teeth in when it comes to subrogation, or if you don't see any liability exposure, if you could just send me a really short report, you don't have to tell me every single detail, then, then there's some cost savings for them. And that doesn't change our investigative process. That doesn't change no. what, what photos you take. It's not like you're gonna take less photos or you're, or you're gonna take less notes that you have to still conduct your investigation the exact same way, but the way that it's communicated to the customer is, is modified by their request. But then we take all those photos and your notes and everything like that, and you upload them on the server and make sure it's backed up in the event that down the road, several years down the road, if your client, for example, requires a more detailed report, you're still able to access all of that information and, and provide a more detailed account of it. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. That's right. Just because we may have put out a short report at the time, it doesn't mean new information uh, doesn't come to light or if a more detailed technical report is required down the road. That could definitely be provided, no problem. Like you said, we have all the data uh, backed up and I do the investigation uh, the same regardless. Okay, great. Uh, there's a few more questions. We will answer all your questions, guys, um, after the webinar. I wanted to just uh, share very exciting news. So Origin and Cause is announcing first, you guys are first to hear this, uh, our annual national tour. We typically go, as I'd mentioned, coast to coast to each of your cities or at least the lar larger cities and um, conduct uh, 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 presentations, technical presentations. This year, we're going to be doing it digitally. Um, similar to what you've done today on GoToWeb, uh, GoToWebinar, and you can tune in and tune out whenever you want. We have five hours of training starting at 11 a.m. Uh, to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So um, we're, we try to find a time slot where folks in, in Newfoundland and folks in BC will be um, have equal opportunity essentially to tune in. Uh, so it's going to be taking place October 28th at 11 to 4 Eastern time. So make that adjustment, I guess, in your in your schedules of the start and end time on your on your side. And we'll be talking about types of fraud investigations or different types of fraud investigations. As I had mentioned in the beginning, for example, one fraud investigation is water frauds, and uh, it's going to be case um, 
kind of case study driven. So we're just going to have a few case studies that we're going to be walking you through and explaining um, kind of what the insured may have done um, to tamper with evidence or, 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 or something like that, which would be defined as a fraudulent claim. Uh, and so we're really excited for this topic. We've been creating the content for the past several months and it's just really, really cool stories and, and uh, concepts that are becoming more and more relevant. We notice when there's a dip in the economy or if there's some sort of catastrophe um, or in, in our case here, COVID, um, we see an uptick in claims that are not very straightforward where physical evidence isn't lining up with what is being stated by, you know, by the insured. Um, there's definitely a correlation between what can be said as fraudulent claims and hard times, hard economic times. So, you know, it's such a relevant topic that we're really excited to report to you guys on and talk to you about it from different perspectives, break and enters, structural fires, vehicle fires, structural claims, not necessarily fires, but like other types of structural related claims. I don't want to, uh, to, to, to expose too much, but it's a great topic. You don't have to be there for the full five hours. We give you the opportunity to sign up to whichever presentation you want to uh, join. And uh, we're really looking forward to it. We hope you can all join in and we're gonna be sending out an email invitation soon. So um, we invite you to share that invitation with your peers if they're interested in joining. It's 100% free of charge. We're, we're very excited to offer this for free as usual. And um, wanted to mention that we'll be donating $25 per attendee to a national charity um, in lieu of what we would typically uh, pay for a venue, uh, for us to actually come out and stuff. Just we, what we want to do is um, donate back to uh, um, foundations that are in need and uh, we'd love to do that with you guys. So we're trying to encourage you guys to actually attend and if you do attend, we'll be donating $25 in, in your name um, uh, to a worthy cause of your choice. We have three different, uh, different, um, uh, charities that we're going to be allocating those to. And when you sign up, we will send you, uh, like a quick email asking you, which of the three do you want your 25 bucks to go to? So we're very excited about that. I've talked too much. Uh, thank you all for joining in. Once you close the webinar screen, you're going to be prompted again with a few questions of which one of them is going to ask you, hey, do you want us to sign you up to uh, the national tour? So tell us if you do. And if you do, it'll give you a, a choice of which one you want us to sign you up to, and we'll get you signed up. Thank you all. And thank you again, Angela, for tuning in and, and uh, walking us through Fire Investigations 101. Have a great day, everyone. Stay safe.